WBZ.com. I'm John Keller from WBZ TV. Tonight on Greater Boston, who benefits from Governor Healy's new multi million dollar tax cut plan? Who doesn't benefit? And how is it all going down on Beacon Hill? We'll dig into all of that. Plus, 55 years after Walter Cronkite famously turned public opinion against the Vietnam War, do Americans have any trust in what journalists believe today? Welcome to Greater Boston. While a lot of us haven't yet gotten started on this year's tax returns, Governor Moore Healey is proposing a $742 million package of tax cuts that could lower what you owe next year. Now, earlier today at a YMCA in Lowell, Healey argued her plan is necessary to help taxpayers stay afloat amid rising inflation. Everywhere we go, the lieutenant governor and I hear about the cost of living and how it's impacting communities, how it's skyrocketing past people, the young mom who wants to return to her dream job but can't afford childcare, the recent college grad who can't make both his rent and his student loan payments, the senior who wants to stay in the home where they raise their family but can't keep up with property taxes, the small business owner contemplating moving to another state that has less burdensome taxes, now, the bulk of this proposal, $458 million worth, is a child and family tax credit that would affect more than 700,000 taxpayers. It would credit families $600 each for dependents with disabilities, children under 13, and senior dependents age 65 and up. Healy's plan is similar to a nearly $700 million tax package proposed last year by Governor Charlie Baker. Uh, this would also increase the state's rental deduction from three to four thousand dollars. Healy's plan uses tax credits to eliminate the estate tax for estates valued up to three million. It cuts the tax rate on short-term capital gains, expands the apprenticeship tax credit program, and raises the cap on housing development incentive program credits. And that's just part of what's in this. Joining me to discuss it are Evan Horowitz, executive director of the Center for State Policy Studies at Tufts University and GBH News State House reporter Katie Lannon. Welcome to you both. Katie, I want to start with you. A lot of these proposals, tax credits for uh, people who care for kids, seniors, and disabled adults, increase in rental deductions, these are not really controversial on Beacon Hill. They've, they've drawn strong legislative support in the past. But the governor's proposals to reduce estate and capital gains tax rates are likely to be controversial. What's the immediate fallout on Beacon Hill? Yeah, it, it was really interesting because right away we saw the, the conservative Massachusetts Fiscal Alliance praising Healy for, for including these and the Raise Up Massachusetts Coalition that helped pass the, the new millionaire's tax knock her for it, which is not usually how a, a Democrat's actions are responded to on Beacon Hill. The, the legislature, uh, we really haven't seen them play their hand yet on this. Uh, top Democrats, House Speaker Ron Mariano and Senate President Karen Spilka, are saying that they want to look at it. They didn't rule out immediately, though, these things like the short-term capital gains tax cut, which they didn't go along with when Governor Baker proposed it. It'll be interesting to see if they are more amenable to it in any way now that it's a, a Democrat suggesting the same thing. Well, that's not always the way things have worked on Beacon Hill in the past. Evan, at the, at the center, you've been looking at many of these proposals for a while in a report you issued last June. You defined the challenge as, quote, assembling a tax cut package that benefits the most vulnerable, improves our state's competitiveness, and avoids unintended long-term consequences, end quote. Does this plan meet those tests? Parts of it do me that test, parts don't. Uh, it varies a lot. I think really the heart of it, as you've said, is the child independent tax credit. This is, you don't even think of it as a tax credit. This is just money that will go to every family that has kids and dependents in the state and will go every year regardless of what they owe in taxes. And it might be controversial simply because it's extremely generous. Um, so this would be a, a major change, I think, that will help hundreds of thousands of families. That's a big deal. And so I think that lives up to the promise of helping those who need it. And we should point out here that we saw something similar happen during the pandemic at the federal level. Correct. And we also saw a dramatic drop 
in, uh, in child, in child poverty. poverty. Yeah, yeah, all across the country has proved extremely effective because it is really just giving people money. Not all of these tax credits work like this. Some of them, you have to owe taxes in order to get some back. It gets complicated. That one's very simple. We okay. just give people checks. The competitiveness side, I think, a little less convincing. Well, tell you what, let's uh, take a listen right now to a comment that Governor Healy made on that subject of competitiveness at a press conference earlier today. We have to acknowledge that there are some aspects of our current tax system that make Massachusetts an outlier. When we don't keep up with other states, you see, we put our own competitiveness at risk. Well, uh, Katie, let me bring you back in here. Uh, we've heard this, I mean, I, I'm old enough, I know it's, it's hard to believe, given my youthful uh, countenance here, but I, I remember the days when Massachusetts was referred to as Taxachusetts. And in fact, businesses and individuals were fleeing the state at a prolific rate. That's when the notion of maintaining our competitiveness became almost kind of a third rail or a staple of Massachusetts politics. Is this still such a persuasive argument as best you can tell? I mean, whether or not it's persuasive, uh, I guess we'll see that play out, right? The the governor is using the number of other states as part of her argument here. So on short-term capital gains, we're one of two states that has a higher rate than long-term. Um, on the estate tax, that's been something that uh, members of all political parties have been talking about for years as a as a way as something that discourages people from staying in Massachusetts when they could be moving to places like Florida, places like New Hampshire, those tend to be the the two that are bandied about and that has been a competitiveness argument that keeps coming up. I, I guess you could say it hasn't been persuasive so far, right? Or at least not persuasive enough for the, the Democrats in the legislature to overcome right. their own differences of opinion about the best way to handle the estate tax. Yeah, and Evan, as Katie pointed out before, what happens when you talk about capital gains cuts is uh, the left says, oh, that's just a, a benefit for the rich. Uh, because it is. And I, right. mean, I mean, so I'm, I'm very sensitive to concerns about yeah. competitiveness. I think we do okay. have to worry about state competitiveness. And that's, I think, why you want to make the maximally effective tax changes to make the state economy more competitive. And these aren't those. I mean, I think that's the problem. It's not that this, uh, the idea that we need to be more competitive is misguided or the idea that, you know, we need to make changes in order to improve our competitiveness. That's all real. But economic policy is not strongly connected to our short-term capital gains rate. That's for day traders and house flippers. And like, this is people who make an investment turn around and undo the investment very quickly. Whereas what you really want for economic competitiveness is long-term investments. And well, so you should have a higher tax uh, on short-term. So this in some ways going the wrong way. And the estate tax also, I mean, it's true that some people will move, the move out of state to avoid paying the estate tax, but those people tend to be retirees. There are older people who are thinking about what's going to happen to them and their states when they die. Those are, tend not to be the kind of people who are running businesses, hiring people. So it doesn't really touch the economy. There are things that do, and there are other kinds of tax changes that you would want to implement if you really care passionately about the competitiveness of the state. These aren't really the areas we would make changes. Well, when uh, a, a similar tax package was floated last year by then Governor Baker, uh, the objections to it, uh, uh, House Speaker Mariano in particular touched on this, included the claim that, hey, we're flush with federal cash right now, our economy is doing pretty well right now, but history shows us that's not necessarily going to last. There are already signs of some economic softening. Uh, do you see, Evan, this becoming a major factor in this debate as they hash this out? Yeah, and I think this is this package is probably a little bit too big to be sustainable in the long term, judging from our own projections for long-term tax revenues. This is a very big package. Right, but this is the opening ante, right? It's designed Possibly. to have some cuts I, I, made in it, right? Uh, maybe, or the legislature might want to add its own priorities. I mean, you don't know how this is right. going to go, right? The, the House has its own set of tax priorities. The Senate had things that are not included in here. Um, and I think we're starting off at, at a level that's probably a little bit too big and does need to get pared back. So I think that will be part of the challenge. A lot hinges on when exactly tax revenues start to come in short. We have been flush now for a couple of years, but that is changing. And whether it's this April or this June or September, we're going to start to see a real um, pairing back in incoming tax revenues. And that's going to change what seems possible on Beacon Hill. So 
if it happens in April, yes, it will affect this discussion very uh, dramatically and concretely. But it might not happen until June, it may not happen until September, it might not happen until December. In which case, we might get to a point this fiscal year where these, this package passes before we recognize the, the constraints that are coming. Yeah, uh, Katie, we were texting uh, back and forth before this uh, interview about the time frame on all this. People need to understand, I think, that uh, this is not something that's got to be voted on in connection with the budget uh, in uh, this summer. Uh, this is a separate entity that could be taken up and voted on at any point or not. Uh, what do, do you feel any sense of urgency on Beacon Hill uh, with regard to this? Well, there, there's not a sense of urgency for much on Beacon Hill right now because the, the session is still getting up and running. We're not really at the, the make it or break it deadline moments yet, which is when we tend to see a lot of action. But like Governor Baker did, Governor Healy is proposing her tax plan as a bill alongside her budget. She's putting the money in her budget, which will be filed Wednesday, to fund it. And, you know, with Governor Baker, we saw his tax plan taken up, you know, rewritten by the legislature and hit the floor in the House and the Senate for votes last July. It never got over the finish line. Um, you know, in a two-year session, which we're just starting on, you, you tend to see the action come in that second year. But Senate President, Senate President Karen Spilka has started the year by calling for, for progressive tax reform to be passed soon. So I think she seems to have an interest in getting it done. Tax bills do have to start in the House, so it'll, it'll be up to them to decide. Evan, first big policy initiative from a new governor, all Democratic legislature. Uh, do you suspect that they'll want to move on this or do you hope that they won't or that they'll take their time? Uh, I don't think there is a lot of time here. And I think there's a reason that even though it is a separate thing, it got filed alongside the budget the same week as the budget, basically, that the hope is that they're on the same time frame. And my own sense is that either this advances alongside the budget, budget or it won't advance. So that it, there really is a kind of clock ticking here through to the end of this year rather than the end of the session. I could be wrong about that, but that's my sense for how people are thinking about it and the most likely path. Wow, interesting point. We'll be watching. Evan Horowitz, Katie Lannon, thank you both very much for the insight. Really appreciate it. Oh, great to be here. 55 years ago tonight, one of the most trusted men ever on television did something news anchors at that time just did not do, shared his opinion, weighing in on the ongoing Vietnam War. It seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. But it is increasingly clear to this report that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. Now, those comments made after Cronkite returned from a reporting trip to Vietnam gave voice to American doubters of the war and also marked a moment for journalists to follow Cronkite's lead and begin covering the Vietnam War through a critical lens. It worked then because the American people had faith and trust in Walter Cron Cronkite. But to paraphrase the man himself, that's not the way it is. That's the way it was today. Just six in 10 adults in the U.S. say they have trust in national news organizations. That's according to the Pew Research Center. Even fewer, just 56% of 18 to 29 year olds say they have trust. So what does this mean for the state of news opinion and analysis? And what can journalists do to regain Americans' trust? To discuss that and a few other media stories we've been following, we're pleased to have with us Jaquetta Van Zandt, host of the Politics and Prosecco videocast, and Joanna Weiss, editor of Experience Magazine, former political reporter for the Boston Globe, and rock star in more <laughs> ways than one. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Hi, John. So, uh, Jaquetta, let's start with you. What would happen if, say, David Muir or Nora O'Donnell were to end their network newscasts with an editorial like what Cronkite did that night? Well, one, I think the country would split in half, and I think that it would start two conversations. One, there's the cancel culture, and then there's those of us who look to journalists to be objective and honest. Um, so I think it'd be, you see a split, and specifically for my generation, which are millennials, um, you know, we don't get all of our information off social media. We turn to CNN, we turn to HLN and MSNBC, and some of us even turn to Fox, not me, but... 
you know, I think that this would start two conversations. They'd be canceled in a minute about, oh, they, they're spreading lies. That's not what we believe. That's not what the government has told us. We don't believe the government. So there's so many conversations that could be had. I mean, back then, Joanna, uh, Lyndon Johnson, president at the time, was said to have remarked after he heard about Cronkite's statement that if I've lost Cronkite, mm -hmm. I've lost the country. Somehow, I don't know that the occupant of the White House today or in modern times would feel the same way. No, well, the options for news were much more limited back then. I mean, you had three major nightly newscasts that everybody tuned into because television was a very limited medium. How many channels were there? What, A10, <laughs> if you counted UHF? Uh, the, there were major newspapers that were the kind of, that, that convened all of the news, and there wasn't an internet where you could sort of spread a story. A story that happened in Minneapolis might not even make it to Boston. So you had, you know, a, a smaller landscape of people who were, who, who commanded so much more of the national attention. Now we have a landscape that is completely splintered and because of economics, because of politics, you can dial into exactly the news that matches your political point of view, and you don't have to be aware of any other point of view even. Now, you mentioned the Internet, and, of course, everybody blames everything on the Internet. Uh, in this case, I think rightly, because you could have someone come out and say, by the way, it's dark now at nighttime, but it'll be brighter tomorrow after the sun comes up. And you would immediately, as you put it, uh, Jack, be attacked by half the country who are saying that's, uh, that's just a conspiracy theory, mm -hmm. or they'd parrot other conspiracy theories they've heard. How do we dig out from under that? I think you have to rely on your own moral compass, yeah. and you have to rely on your own education. I think what is interesting for me in studying Walter Cronkite is humanity was always at the center of his news reports. It was always about how to be relatable, he wasn't interested in being a personality, where I feel a lot of journalists and a lot of anchors tend to want to be celebrities more than give informative information. And so for me, I think it's having that center. You know, where do we come back to? How are we relatable? How am I making sure that the country is hearing what I'm saying as opposed to just listening to the news? But, you know, you're suggesting a degree of effort by the consumer, <laughs> by the viewer. And, you know, we've talked about this before, Joanna. I, I just don't think many news consumers are willing to put in that kind of effort anymore. Mm. They want their itch scratched and they want it scratched now. Yeah, I mean, I think there may be more people sampling than we want to give credit for. I mean, I think that partly we, we kind of buy into a myth that the country is more divided than it, than it necessarily is. And, and you, you do have to remember that some of these cable news channels, they only get a sliver of the population. But that's partly because news is dispersed. Some people are getting their news only off of TikTok these days. I mean, you, don't, you just don't have any medium that's commanding the kind of attention that you used to have. But then you also also have these cable channels where you have the the news operation and then you have the personalities and sometimes yeah. they are separate and sometimes they really merge together and so on a network like Fox you've got uh, in the evening these personalities who are opinion journalists entirely, if you can even call them journalists, who still are commanding this idea that they're presenting the news to their willing audience. I, I got to move on but real quickly don't even think about it. Name a journalist who, when you see them, you instinctively trust them. Oh. <laughs> it's hard, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. Can you name one? I mean, I've got, you know, you can, you can go back to the old days where I would say, did I trust, you know, Peter Jennings of NBC, or ABC, ABC sorry, yeah. growing up. Um, you know, I don't, it's hard to even name the network newscasters now. Yeah. Does Oprah count? I'm sorry? So does Oprah count? Op I trust Oprah always. Yeah, oh, Oprah counts. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Um, the biggest media story of the decade, in my opinion, and maybe even longer than that, is unfolding right now before our eyes, and it's the uh, Dominion voting systems lawsuit against Fox News. $1.7 I believe, they're looking for. Uh, and last week... Uh, there were a number of emails brought out during legal discovery procedures that seem to, uh, from my perspective and from the perspective of others, pretty much lock up the case <laughs> that Fox executives and anchors knew that they were perpetuating lies about voting fraud in the 2020 election and about Dominion 
uh, that they reviled these claims as ridiculous behind the scenes, but then went on the air and spread them and invited people on to spread them. Uh, well, uh, Fox's Howard Kurtz, who hosts that network's weekly media review, media and review show, uh, came out yesterday and said the following about this mega media story. Let's listen. Some of you have been asking why I'm not covering the Dominion voting machines lawsuit against Fox involving the unproven claims of election fraud in 2020. And it's absolutely a fair question. I believe I should be covering it. It's a major media story, given my role here at Fox. But the company has decided that as part of the organization being sued, I can't talk about it or write about it, at least for now. I strongly disagree with that decision, but as an employee, I have to abide by it. Think he'll be back on next Sunday? No, <laughs> no I do not. <laughs> yeah, really? Go ahead. I do not. Um, this is major for Fox. It talks about their branding. It goes to their reputation, their credibility. His ability to speak out freedom of press, freedom of thought. Um, his ability to speak out is against everything that they tell their viewers to watch out for. He will now become an enemy of the state, and that's the scary part. I mean, we've talked about Fox just a minute ago, that they have these personalities. They have also always had a news side and people who really tried to hold the line and be news reporters. Shepard Smith was a longtime mm -hmm. news anchor who really tried, I think, to, to be as objective as possible within the confines of his job. Chris Wallace, you know, excellent interviewer and political journalist. And I think Howard Kurtz, who came from the Washington Post and then was at CNN, is a real journalist at Fox. Uh, you know, one by one they have left. <laughs> one by one they have decided that they can't take that pressure anymore. And yeah, is Howie Kurtz going to be the next person? It could be. I'm not so sure. I mean, I, I, I do not play a big time media executive on TV or in real life, <laughs> so I'm, I'm projecting a little bit here. But I, I fail to see exactly how this helps Fox's standing, uh, perhaps not so much in the courtroom as in the court of public opinion. Their own guy just called them out for suppressing any discussion of a story that the entire country knows about. What am I missing? Well, here's the question is who's running the show here? Is it the audience or is it the programmers or is it the journalists? And this is this was the subtext and, and often the text of all of these things that came out in Discovery is like, yeah, we know this, but our audience wants to hear something different and we've taken our audience on this ride so far that we might lose them if we don't keep feeding them the things that they expect. But I would venture to say that their audience is now split also. So there are people who are diehard Fox fans, and then there are people who are like, okay, I'm going to get a little bit of my news from Fox. I'm going to do my own research. Not many, but I think that they're split. And for me, this is a tsunami. This is going to have great effects all the way even to Congress, because a lot of those people in Congress who are perpetuating that lie now have to dial it back. You're going to see a lot of people going on an apology tour. And unfortunately, he is the sacrificial lamb. I, I just believe that. Well, you know, the number of people who believe the big lie mm -hmm. about the 2020 election, uh, the number of Republicans and or conservatives who say they believe it, is still high. I believe it's still a solid majority, but it has dwindled yes. from the early days of 2021, mm -hmm. the end of 2020. Uh, at some point, doesn't it become a, a diminishing return uh, for Fox to try to pretend otherwise. I mean, I, I'm just not sure what's in it for but them. Didn't this kind of happen during Watergate, though? Like this, I mean, it was deny, deny, deny. And then, okay, well, maybe this part is true or, or you know, this person is responsible. And then I forget the lady, the mouth of the South, um, you know, she also had a, a part in that Watergate um, blowing it up. I think that that's Martha Mitchell. Gonna, yeah. Martha Mitchell. I think that's going to happen as well. Well, Here. once the tapes came out, though, all the Republicans <laughs> yes. bailed. But all Already on yeah. Fox, already on Fox, they, for the most part, maybe maybe not Tucker Carlson in his deepest moments, for the <laughs> most part, if you watch Fox during the day, they acknowledge that Joe Biden was president. Nobody was really, really perpetuating that lie <laughs> in a real way. It was, it, it, it became a fringe issue. What you didn't get on Fox, though, was very much coverage at all or acknowledgement of the January 6th insurrection. It was like, let's just pretend this stuff didn't happen. Yeah. It was just a tiny thing. Don't look over there. Let's just, let, let's go on to today's right. new talking point. It'll be interesting to see how they wind up uh, coming out of all this, not just legally, but in terms of ratings. Uh, one more uh, topic I want to mix in here, and it's 
sorry for those folks who are just uh, coming out of dinner here. It's a little bit uh, nauseating to even talk about. Uh, but um, uh, Scott Adams, the cartoonist who's behind the Dilbert mm. comic strip and has been a frequent right-wing voice in social media, has had his work dropped by hundreds of newspapers. He's lost his book contract after he posted a video rant in which he described the 26% of black respondents who answered, a, who answered no to a poll question asking, is it okay to be white? Not like any poll question I've ever heard, but there it is. He described uh, that as a hate group and urged white people to, quote, get the hell away from black people. And he added that it is, quoting again, no longer a rational impulse for a white citizen to try to help black citizens, end quote. So on the right, of course, they're calling this canceling. Seems to me it's more like publishers uh, not wanting their brand to be associated with this vile, ignorant bigotry. What, what do you make of it, Jack? Scott Adams is a racist, and what he said was offensive. It was not only offensive to me, but it was offensive to white people as well, because there are definitely many of us, black and white, who believe that we are all uni united in this country. What bothers me about Scott Adams is that he has a platform. And I don't care if they want to call it cancel culture or not. My people are not a hate group. We are a group of people who have built this country and are unapologetic about our pride, just as he should be unapologetic about his. But what he cannot do is oppress my people and put a label on us. That we will not tolerate. Well, and look at self-cancellation, because he is savvy enough at this point to know that if you put something out there on the internet to a broad audience that will see it, there will be consequences. Yes. What he said was extraordinarily extreme and racist. Yes. And how do you, you know, that's not someone coming and digging something out of your past <laughs> that could be interpreted one way. He went out there and said it and knew what was going to happen. Yeah. What if it turns out that this doesn't hurt him financially, that he gets other jobs as a result of it, his fellow crackpots and racists rally behind him, and uh, he winds up being made whole. He could have that. Listen, and let him yeah. have all the financial. Michael Jackson will still be the greatest dancer that ever walked the stage. Mike Tyson will hit harder than any man has ever punched. Michael Jordan will continue to dunk, so my people are okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we are fine. Let him live his life. But don't oppress mine. Well, you know, ask Donald Trump if he wishes that he'd been on Twitter all this time instead of having to go on Truth Social. You know, I mean, you, yes, he can get an audience that is like-minded people. But if he doesn't have the broad audience that he used to have, he's still lost something. It'd be good to learn that fomenting uh, racial hatred is not a good business model. Mm -hmm. uh, I hope that's the case. I guess we'll have to wait and see. Well, shout out to the publishers, though, who took a yeah. stand and said, we will not tolerate this. So. Jaquetta Van Zandt, Joanna Weiss, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you both. That's it for tonight. More Greater Boston tomorrow at this time. I'm John Keller from Channel 4. Thanks to my friends at GBH for having me, and thanks for watching. Good night.